Good morning. It's great to have you with us for online worship. Whether you're from uh, Temple Patrick, Hyde Park, or Lyle Hill, or indeed a visitor, we do extend to you a very warm word of welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that some are back to live worship in Temple Patrick, Hyde Park, and Lyle Hill this morning, and we pray that that will be a blessing. But I also know that some are not for various reasons. Some are unable, some are cautious, or perhaps don't feel comfortable just yet. And for some in Temple Patrick, it's just not your turn, because your surname doesn't begin with a letter between A to L. However, next week, God willing, you'll get your turn for live worship. And on that note, let me remind you of a few things for next Sunday. As we've said in previous weeks, we will continue to broadcast these pre-recorded services each Sunday at 11 a.m. However, if your surname begins with a letter between M to Z, you're very welcome to join with us next Sunday at 11 a.m. in the main hall. Please arrive on time and ensure that you socially distance, follow the signage provided, and observe the instructions that the stewards give. They'll keep you right. Although it's not mandatory, we encourage you to wear a face mask unless you're exempt from wearing one. And for further details, check our church Facebook page or website. Please bear with us. We've never experienced anything like this before. It's very new to us. And we're trying our best to ensure everything works smoothly and that everyone is kept safe as we seek to reopen. With regards to the reopening of organizations, again, we're still feeling our way through this. However, we're hoping to start waiting on God, a time of prayer and reflection, this Wednesday, the 9th of September, from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. For further details, please speak to Richard or myself. And then finally, can I thank everyone who will take part in this service and indeed those working behind the scenes to make it all possible. It is greatly appreciated. Although we live in uncertain days, it is good to be reminded that we have a faithful God in every way. And as a call to worship, I'd like us to responsively read those well-known verses on God's faithfulness found in Lamentations 3. I'll read the red text if you could respond in the black text. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of of the Lord. Amen. And with these words on our lips, let us join together in the very appropriate and wonderful words of that great old hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee.
Well, let us unite our hearts in prayer. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Oh, Father, what a wonderful reminder it has been to read those amazing words and lamentations and to sing this great hymn of praise to you. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, your faithfulness in each of our lives throughout the years and generations. Father, what an amazing truth to know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're sovereign and in complete control. Not one thing goes unnoticed by you, and nothing takes you by surprise. For thou changest not, thy compassions they feel not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us over these past few months during this pandemic. How wonderful it has been to be reminded that all I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Lord, we bless you today for how you control the seasons, how you created all things through you and for you, that your mercy and grace is abundant to all creation and your holiness and brightness can be seen in everything. We adore you, Lord, this morning for giving us the opportunity to meet as a church family in this place and indeed for enabling us to continue broadcasting these services each Sunday. May these services be a blessing to all who attend and watch for Christ's glory. Yet, Father, we must confess that we have sinned against you. Sometimes we have fretted, worried, and perhaps felt that your presence hasn't been with us. We have forgotten to count our blessings and remember your great faithfulness. For this we're sorry, and we ask you for forgiveness. We confess also, Lord, that we have said, done, and thought things that have not been holy as you are holy. We confess to you our sins of omission and commission, the sins that we have, that we know we have committed, and the things we never even thought about. We pray with the psalmist, in this short silence, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, we don't want to sin, and yet we keep sinning. Forgive us, we pray, in your mercy. Help us, Holy Spirit, to live in God's ways and follow Christ in every area of our lives. But we do thank you for how the hymn writer has reminded us that because of Christ's death on the cross, we can have a pardon for sin and a peace that endureth when we trust in Christ with all our hearts. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us from our sins and enabling us to know that peace and assurance that you have removed our sins from us and you remember them no more. So, Heavenly Father, accept these our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, boys and girls, Richard is now going to come and speak with you. Good morning, boys and girls. I hope you're all well. Uh, and I know that many of you, uh, are, if not most of you, are back at school. This autumn in church, we're going to be thinking about a person called Peter. He's a disciple of Jesus. And actually, when we first meet him in the Bible, he's called Simon. But Jesus changes his name to Peter. And we're going to be thinking a little bit about that next week. But this week, I want to think about how Jesus calls Peter to follow him. One day, Peter and his brother were out working. His brother was called Andrew. Do you know what their job was? Well, this picture gives you a little bit of a clue. They were fishermen. And they were mending their nets. And they were casting those nets into the sea to try to catch fish. When all of a sudden, someone came along and everything started to change. They had spent their lives fishing. They'd grown up fishing. Their dad was a fisherman, probably their grandfather. Being a fisherman was all that they, that they ever knew. But then somebody came along and interrupts them and changes their lives. Did you hear that? 
Oh, there's an interruption as well. It's my telephone. I wonder who it might be. Do you think I should answer it? Maybe it's Brenda. Or perhaps Brian looking for me. Maybe it's a call from Ian Barraclough for the new Northern Ireland squad. Or perhaps Boris Johnson asking me to come and give him a hand with running the country. Oh, do you think should I answer it? What if it's an emergency? What if somebody needs me? Let's say, for example, somebody had a serious injury or illness and they needed help right away. You would need to be able to answer the question, the answer the phone, isn't that right? If there was a problem, you would lift up the phone and ring 999. And when you call 999, the person who answers that asks, what help do you need? And their job is to get you that help, whether that's an ambulance or a fire brigade or the police. And that person would never say to you, I'm sorry, I'm really busy right now. Maybe some other time. No way. They would drop everything they're do doing and make sure that you get the help you need as fast as possible. You see, Jesus was the person who interrupted Peter and Andrew. He was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. And he called out to them, come, follow me. And you see, Jesus wanted Peter and Andrew to come and join him in sharing the good news of what he had come to do. To tell people that Jesus loves them. Boys and girls, and mums and dads, and grannies and grandas, and everyone. That he came into our world to live with us, to die for us, and to bring us into the family of God. Of course, Peter and Andrew decide to follow Jesus. And a little further along the beach, Jesus calls James and John. Those four become his first disciples. James and John were busy when Jesus came to them too. They were mending their nets. But they didn't say, oh, we're too busy. They obeyed Jesus. They accepted his call to follow and they went with him. And they left their dad and the hired hands with the boat. You see, Jesus calls us too today. He doesn't call us to leave school or to leave our work or to leave whatever we're doing. But he calls us to put him first in our lives. To follow him. To trust him. To have Jesus as our special friend. The one who's promised that he will always be with us, that he will never forsake us. Because Jesus is God's son, sent into our world to live with us, to die for us, to bring us to God, to make us part of his family. When Jesus calls us, what do we say? I hope you're not like me and ignore the call of this telephone, but rather you listen to Jesus. You answer his call to follow him, to trust him, to do what he wants and to share his love with others every day and in every way. We're going to sing a song that's called This Little Light of Mine.
We're starting a new series this morning and through this autumn uh, in the life of Peter and the Gospels. The Gospels are full of Peter and full of what he says. No other disciple is mentioned more often than he is. But he's a complex character. At times he gets things spot on. And at other times, he gets things spectacularly wrong. He's very human. You might describe him as a rough diamond. And yet, we can learn so much from him because he is so human. We can learn much about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, both from his successes and his failings. Mark introduces him in his gospel in this passage that we're going to look at this morning. He's introduced as Simon, and we'll be looking a little bit more about how Jesus gives him the name Peter next week. We're going to turn now to Mark chapter 1 and reading from verse 14. It's going to be read for us by Christine Patterson. Mark chapter 1 verses 14 to 31. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her 
and she began to wait on them. It's all change. So much change and transition as we come out of lockdown. This morning, some of us are returning to corporate worship. Others are waiting for their turn next week. Others still are cautious about returning and are waiting to see what happens. Change makes demands of us. And we all handle change differently. Some of us are embracing coming out of lockdown. Some of us are much more tentative. As I speak to people, I hear different perspectives. And we're not only starting to reopen our buildings this morning. We're not only coming into a new season with all that that brings. And I know for some people, there's a lot of transition going on. But this morning, we're also starting to look at a new series as we explore in the life of Peter as we find him in the Gospels. And today we read of a massive change for Peter and for Andrew, James and John, a change that totally and utterly transforms their lives. They're called by Jesus into a new and unknown way of life, something away from the familiar. Our series is on Peter, but more specifically, it's reflecting on how Peter encounters Jesus. And the gospel writers, in their various versions of this story, focus first on Jesus, on who he is and what he has come to do. And Jesus announces his ministry with the words, The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and hear the good news. Sorry, repent and believe the good news. Mark's account is the first of the four Gospels. And many of in the early church would have attributed a large influence to the Apostle Peter. With that in mind, we'd expect there to be an emphasis on Peter, and we'd be right. But the emphasis, of course, is primarily on Jesus, the one who brings good news in his coming into our world. And we're going to be thinking, first of all today, about Jesus in a very simple way as we look at these verses from 16 through to 18, about what Jesus does. We see how he walked, how he saw and what he says. The first thing we note is that Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. It seems a very normal thing to do. Many of us have been walking through lockdown, many of us walking much more than we have done before. And that has been largely good for us. And the shores of Lake Galilee are a peaceful and beautiful place to walk. In fact, if you go there, you'll discover that it's probably very similar to what it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked there. It hasn't changed that much. At first glance, Jesus walking by the lake seems a very ordinary thing to do. But whenever we start to think about it, we realize that there's a, great, a much deeper significance. Because Jesus is no ordinary person. He is the Son of God Come to live with us. In a sense, God is walking with us. God who walked in the cool of the Garden of Eden. God who desires that his people walk with him. He himself has taken on flesh and walks where we walk. It's as if Jesus is walking in Paradise Walk or Rickamore and Carnanee. Or Balibentra. He chooses to walk where we walk. He meets us where we are. God incredibly doesn't opt out or wash his hands. Even when we choose our own way. But he comes to live among us. To rescue us. To save us. From the mess of our broken COVID prone world. This series on Peter begins with God entering our world in Jesus. 
Jesus walks. Secondly, we're told that Jesus saw. And I don't think that was simply a casual observation out of the corner of his eye. He really saw. He took in what he saw. He is genuinely interested in two brothers casting their net into the lake. It was an ordinary event, repeated day after day along the shores of Lake Galilee. Peter and Andrew and James and John were no other than ordinary fishermen doing ordinary hard work as they had done probably for most of their lives. The same job in the same lake every day. In the same way that many of us do our ordinary jobs day by day, whatever that may be. Jesus saw and God sees us. He doesn't miss a thing. It doesn't pass him by that we have found aspects of lockdown difficult, furlough challenging, the economic climate unstable and unsettling. He sees and he understands. Indeed, he knows us. He knows what we're dealing with. Because he sees not just the outward veneer that we so often put on. He knows us as we are. And there's no need for us to hide anything from him. I don't believe for a moment that Peter and Andrew, James and John were anything more than ordinary men in the sense that they represent each one of us. We don't have to be somebody for God to notice us. In fact, in many ways, the opposite is the case. It's those who come simply as they are who can receive Christ and enjoy that relationship with him. What strikes me about Jesus seeing these men fishing is that he values us as people. He sees our potential. And if you think we're going to be looking at a ready-made man in this series and Peter, well, you're wrong. Peter has a lot of flaws. God has much to do with him. But yet God in Jesus sees his potential. Peter's like you and I. Peter's life with its highs and lows, its achievements and failures speaks to our lives. We can all learn from Peter. Jesus walked. Jesus saw. And then thirdly, Jesus spoke. And when he speaks, it's an interruption. An interruption to the way of life of these fishermen by Lake Galilee. We too have had to deal with a significant interruption over these past months. And we've all handled that interruption of COVID differently. But I want to ask you to consider this. Do you think that God may be saying something to you in the interruption? Is it possible that there were things in your life that were actually taking you away from God rather than towards him? Could it be that lockdown and its aftermath provides an opportunity to reevaluate what's important? And particularly the importance of a relationship with God. What does God want for you? Jesus' mission is articulated in verse 15, where he announces his ministry with the words, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. It's an interruption to the way of life that these fishermen have known. It's a call to a change of direction, because that's what repentance is all about. It's totally turning away from something and turning towards something else. Jesus' interruption of Peter and Andrew's world is presented in the NIV translation in Mark's gospel in two parts. The initial invitation is to come, follow me. It's a call from where they're at or from what they're doing. A call to leave the familiar, that which they've become used to, their way of life, their family, 
It's a call too from the security and comparative stability of the family business. Of course, we're familiar with farms and businesses being built up and passed down through the generations. We have some idea of the commitment required and expected. Choosing another way of life isn't easy. We need to be sure that it's worthwhile. And we might imagine how Peter and Andrew felt at this invitation from Jesus to come, follow him, and leave behind all that they have known. And although this passage implies an immediate response, there is a suggestion from the other Gospels that this has been over a period of time. But it's not just leaving the familiar. They're stepping into something new. Jesus wants to mold them and to shape them and to give them a whole new perspective, a whole new direction in life. From the second part of what he says, he tells them, I will send you out to fish for people. Jesus is, of course, calling his disciples. He's calling them to a radically different way of life, to walk with him, to learn from him, indeed to suffer rejection with him Because his lot will not be easy. But he's also giving them a new purpose. To bring people to him. He's inviting them to share with him in his ministry. Jesus also calls us. Not necessarily to leave our present workplaces. Although that is possible. But certainly to leave behind anything that comes between us and him and step out into a new way, into the life in its fullness that he offers. He's offering us an alternative way of seeing life, a life with him at the helm where he's in charge as our savior and our Lord, where we place our trust in him completely. The 19th century Danish philosopher, Søren Kierkegaard, wrote, It's not the adherents of a teaching, but followers of a life that Christ is looking for. Jesus calls us to follow into a radical new way of living. And make no mistake about it, Peter and Andrew's response to Jesus' invitation took guts. It involves trust, absolute trust In the person of Jesus. It challenges us too. About whether we're prepared. To put our trust completely in Jesus. In his call in our lives. And in all that he has done for us. Especially on the cross. The US Senator Mark Hatfield. Tells us of touring Calcutta. At the time when Mother Teresa. Was working in the slums there. And he visited the so-called house of the dying where sick children were cared for in their last days. And the dispensary where the poor line up in there, hundreds to receive medical attention. Watching Mother Teresa minister to these people, feeding and nursing those left to, by others to die. Hatfield was overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the suffering that she and her co-workers were dealing with. How can you bear the load Without being crushed by it, he asked Mother Teresa. She replied, My dear Senator, I am not called to be successful. I am called to be faithful. Jesus calls us to follow, to be faithful, to trust him completely. And we can trust him because he is trustworthy. He will never let us down. The pattern of Jesus' call and the disciples' response also reflects the rhythm of our worship in our services. And we have attempted to include that through lockdown with responses to Scripture and in saying the Lord's Prayer and indeed a response to God's Word. God, in this sense, here through Jesus, 
initiates. He reaches out. He takes the first step, literally in coming into our world and walking by the Sea of Galilee. And in our worship, we respond to God who initiates, who reaches out to us as we remind ourselves in word and prayer and song all that he has done for us. And God's word invites us to to action, to follow, to trust. We're always called to respond. Jesus walks with us. He sees us where we are. And he speaks into our lives, calling us to himself, calling us to a better way, a way with him. And as we enter a new phase in the life of our church, as we attempt to emerge from lockdown, we're invited by Jesus to respond to that call, placing our trust completely in him. Of course, we don't know the future. We don't know what these coming months will hold. But we do know the one who holds the future. The God who sent his son into our world. Who walks with us. Who died for us. And who can be trusted to bring us through. Amen. We're going to sing a song now entitled Beneath the Cross. Of Jesus. us pray. Dear Lord, we want to take this time to thank you for your call on our lives. In the same way that you called Peter and the other disciples, we know that you want us to follow you. We know that you have promised to always be with us and we ask that you would help us to follow you in all areas of our lives. We want to pray for your safety and protection as schools and churches start to reopen. It has been a strange and unsettled time for all of our children as they have coped with so many changes. We pray for children and young people as they try to settle back into school life and ask that you will ease any worries or questions they might have. We pray for teachers and education staff as they help our children settle back to school with so many new rules and restrictions in place. We pray for our young people as they return to university, 
college or work. Learning and working environments have seen significant changes and we ask for your help as our young people learn to adapt. Help each of our young people be an example of your love in their surroundings. Lord, we thank you that even in the midst of all uncertainty, you have given many of us the opportunity to spend more time with our families. We pray that relationships and families will have been strengthened by this time together. We do want to pray for families where this has not been the case and where lockdown has resulted in increased abuse and neglect. There are so many children who suffer in silence and who need your love and protection. We pray that as a community and as a church that we would be able to provide love and support where we can. Thank you that our church has been able to reopen this morning for some of our congregation. We pray that you will guide Richard and the elders as they make difficult decisions to try and keep everyone safe. Thank you for the online service and meetings that we do that we have been able to have while the building was closed. And thank you that this will continue for those who can't yet attend church. We pray for Richard and James and so many others who are involved in preparing the church services. Give them the wisdom, time and energy that they need in their preparations. As we approach harvest time, we pray for the farmers in our church family. We thank you for their hard work to produce all of the crops and produce that we enjoy. We thank you for all of your provision for us. As the situation with COVID-19 continues to be very uncertain, we pray for your peace in our lives at this time. There are so many questions and at times it seems there are so very few answers. But we thank you that you're in complete control. We ask that you would help us to trust you and that our government would look to you as they make decisions. We ask for your protection for ourselves and our families. Lord, as we look around the world, it is easy to despair at all of the situations that we see. So many countries have been devastated by war as refugees risk their lives to try and find safety. Deep-rooted divisions mm -hmm. cause death and sadness all over our world. Millions of people face starvation, poverty and illness with no means to fight it. Lord, we ask that you would give us compassion for your people all around the world. Help us not to be so focused on our own problems, but do what we can to help those who desperately need it. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and facing big questions about their health. We also pray for their loved ones who can feel so helpless. Please give your comfort and peace to those who need it so much at this time. Lord, we thank you that we can ask all of these things in your name and know that you will be faithful to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is an invitation from Jesus. I heard the voice of Jesus say,
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.